Sağamışı dobis, zaten dedi malıba. Mobizane bir stüs, zaten az çöni audit oriyar. Ararız aslında çok holun kartunun olanı, İngilizce ruse gadaval. It's our pleasure and honor to have today. It's our university campus, prominent economist, Mr. Guriev, Sergey Guriev. It's I think our privilege to have this opportunity this evening. I think the theme is at least very interesting for me. So, political economics of of the EU neighborhood, which is interesting definition on its own, because I mean, I don't think. The EU has really boiled down what the neighborhood is, and it's also, I mean, changing as the political economics is also changing. Uh, and uh, only thing on which I think we agree is that this wide area needs uh, reforms. Everybody announces it, everybody proclaims that they are doing reforms, but uh, the rest we will, I think, hear uh, from Mr. Guriev. Uh, thank you very much. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vato. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here in Kahabindukidze campus in the Free University and Agricultural University. Uh, I have known Kaha for many years. It's uh, for me, it is a very special place. I've never been to this university, but um, we discussed uh, the concept of this university when he was thinking about, together with Bato, uh, uh, building the university. And uh, I myself, I was running a similar university in Moscow, a new economic school before I had to leave Moscow. And uh, in that sense, it's a uh, a great pleasure to see that this university has been built, this university is developing, growing, its reputation is increasingly uh, uh, excellent outside the country as well. And uh, for Kaha, it's of course the best legacy to see that uh, what he was dreaming about is actually going in the right direction. I will talk exactly about what Vato mentioned, the political economy of reforms in the EU neighborhood. My job is to think about these issues for EBRD countries of operations. And uh, if I would say countries of operations, you would probably not be as excited as EU neighborhood, which is also a, um, somewhat a bureaucratic and vague term. Uh, but uh, indeed, the truth is that we operate in countries where, which are no longer post-communist countries only. The neighborhood concept changes. What used to be your neighborhood 30 years ago or 25 years ago when the BRD was created has become part of the EU. Well, new countries which never had communist legacy have become part of the neighborhood. And uh, we now work in Middle East, North Africa, Turkey. Our definition of Central Asia includes Mongolia. And, uh, in that sense, uh, we have a much more diverse geography. What is interesting, though, that countries where we work in have similar, similar sets of issues, and different countries address them differently when they talk about the reforms. So what I'll do now, I would like to actually answer your questions. And before that, I will uh, give us something like 10 or 15 minute introduction, how we think about political economy of reform. But I also would like to say that as a uh, staff member of an international organization, I will be um, reasonably positive about all countries which are shareholders of EBRD, which includes m something like 68 countries, 70 countries. So if you want me to criticize specific governments, this is something which will be hard for me to do. Uh, on the other hand, I can be reasonably open and critical about policies of those governments and countries. So in some cases, I may or may not be able to take some of your questions. So. Uh, please uh, understand that uh, we as international bureaucrats have our constraints and limitations. There are countries which are doing pretty bad job on reforms, which are outside of EBRD's region, 
which are not shareholders of EBRD, so I can be extremely open criticizing North Korean government or Venezuelan government. Uh, so, but that, I guess, is not very interesting. So let me say a few words about um, uh, what political economy of reforms is. I assume that audience here is very diverse, so please uh, forgive me for saying things uh, which are um, maybe obvious to some people in the room and less obvious to the other. Uh, people in the room. So what do we mean by political economy of reform? Reforms in general, uh, when we think about reforms, we think about uh, reforms that make country uh, more prosperous, promoting economic growth, sustainable and inclusive growth, uh, reforms which increase social well-being, welfare, and so on. And then the question is why not all countries implement those reforms? Why not all countries manage to become rich, prosperous, democratic, inclusive, and so on. This is a very old question. It goes back at least to Adam Smith, but actually further uh, back in history. But if you ask this question, why some people, uh, some countries, sorry, are rich and some countries are poor, uh, some people would say, well, some countries are stuck in bad geographies. And then uh, some countries are uh, located very well and have a lot of uh, natural resources. But if you actually look around the world, you see a lot of rich countries which have no resources and uh, some countries which are in very unfortunate geographic locations and still they are rich. Some people would say um, some countries are poor because they have this culture, mentality, religion, identity, even genetics, which don't allow them to implement the right socio-economic models, political models. Some people would say this country is not suited for democracy and this country is not suited for market economy because it's never had market economy, it's never had democracy. And that country is supposed to be corrupt forever because it's always been corrupt. So the answer to this question is one, all countries which are democratic and uh, market-oriented economies are countries which used to be corrupt, used to be non-democratic and used to be not prosperous. And uh, uh, until they became open, honest, uh, and market-oriented, they were not. On the other hand, we also see that some countries which were part of the same nation diverged. And if you think, for example, in South and North Korea, East and West Germany, this is a very important experiment which shows that countries with the same heritage, countries with the same ethnicity, countries with the same culture, can actually do very differently if they pursue different ways in terms of policies and institutions. So the question is, uh, maybe some countries, some governments, some nations don't know what to do. And maybe if you go uh, 100 years back, or even 30 years back, there would be a disagreement. So which are the policies which promote uh, competition, growth, innovation, job creation, um, right institutions, and some people would say, I open this textbook, it doesn't tell me this, this, and that. By now, this explanation also doesn't fly because there is a lot economists know about reforms, about the right institutions, about the growth models. And so the answer to this question, uh, why some countries are not implementing the right policy, uh, can only come down to the simple answer, they don't want to. And then the question is, they who are they? Who, what is a country? Who is making policies? And of course, in every country, we talk about the government, the elite groups, and then we need to figure out who makes political decisions about socioeconomic policy. And this is where political economy comes into play. You may think about a policy which benefits country as a whole, but doesn't benefit the elite groups. You may imagine a situation in which it is clear that this policy would promote the welfare of the citizens of the country, but would actually undermine the, ben the benefits appropriated by specific elites which run country today, run politics of the country today. And that's exactly what political economy of reforms is. Political economy of uh, growth promoting policies, growth promoting institutions, these are, these are the challenges. And so when we come back to our post-communist region or our current region, uh, which is a bit bigger than post-communist region only, uh, we start thinking about exactly those issues. And so what I'm going to say now is not necessarily related to this country. And actually this country, Georgia, 
is different in many, many ways from an average country in our region. And uh, I guess uh, eventually we'll come, come to Georgia, but my comparative advantage is actually not to tell you about Georgia, but tell you about countries other than Georgia, as uh, my job is indeed to uh, compare those countries, travel around those countries, and analyze data about those countries. While I would actually like to learn uh, um, about Georgia from you. I, I shouldn't say that I don't know anything about Georgia, I do, but uh, uh, my comparative advantage probably is in other countries. So what is this narrative or this story about economic transition and po political transition in our countries? So if you actually look at the trajectory of economic growth since, 98, uh, since, since 1989 or 1991, whenever the country started the reforms, in uh, most countries you can actually tell the story of success in the sense that the GDP per capita, income per capita convergence has actually happened. In the sense that the gap between average income in post-communist country and average income in the West over these 25 or 30 years has actually decreased, and decreased substantially. Our countries on average have been growing sufficiently fast and actually reduce this gap quite substantially. And of course, the quality of life improved much more than just the income, because I see some people who are not as young as the students, so these people probably remember that uh, even if you had rubles, you would also need to invest a lot of time to be able to spend those rubles uh, to get the goods you want. So in any event, the question is if transition has been a success in terms of economic growth. And again, uh, in Georgia, the first 10 years were not a success, but a disaster. But um, uh, let me talk about the region on average. So the question is why already in mid-2000s, people started to dislike the reformers and kick them out of office whenever the election was free and fair. We at the BRD started to feel this uh, rejection of reforms, and we started to run household surveys. So normally BRD is about firms, investment, banks. Uh, but we also figured out that if people dislike the reforms, it will eventually translate in political economy of rejection of further reforms. And so we started to run this survey called Life and Transition Survey, and the first round was in 2006. Together with the World Bank, we repeated this survey in 2010 and in 2015 and 16, where we go to representative samples of people in all of our countries and we measure the attitudes to various things, but also towards market reforms and democracy. And already in 2006, we saw that in majority of our countries, people would be against private property, against market reforms, and in many countries also against democratic reforms which is striking, of course, because uh, on average, these reforms have delivered a lot of benefits to those countries. And so we started, of course, to look closer. And the first, uh, the first look was exactly at the distribution of the benefits. And this is where the big surprise came across. So uh, we are based in London, and we, of course, talk to people who have gained from the reforms. So, if you are in London, you talk to Russians or Hungarians or Polish people, or if you talk to, uh, if you even talk to Ukrainians based in London, these are the people who've gained from the reforms. But actually, these people are a small minority. So if you look at uh, individuals who've gained from the reforms uh, in an average transition country, in an average transition country, it turns out that people who can say, well, my incomes were growing faster than the incomes of uh, Western counterparts. So the gap between what I earn and what a German earns has actually shortened, uh, decreased over the course of the transition. You will actually see that these people are a minority, and in some countries, a very small minority. In a typical story is actually Russia. In Russia, if you look at the distribution of income, and if you look at the uh, uh, uh, who actually has their incomes growing and growing faster than G7 countries' incomes, you would see that the bottom 10% of Russians have actually negative income growth. And then the next 60% of Russians would have uh, positive income growth during the transition. But this income growth 
would actually be shorter, uh, slower than income growth of rich countries. And so for those Russians, for the majority of Russians, for the 60% with positive income and 10% with negative income growth, uh, their incomes have actually lagged behind the incomes of rich counterparts, and for them, transition has not delivered. It's only the top 20 or 30% of Russians who've actually benefited from transition. And these are the top Russians, not the bottom Russians. And in that sense, um, this is a story of a transition which delivered on average, because benefits to the top 30 or 20% are so large that on average, the Russian economy was growing faster than rich economies. But if you ask yourself, okay, for how many people this growth translated into their own incomes, that is actually a small minority, and these are the best skilled and the um, uh, richest and uh, most, uh, uh, most fortunate people. And this is the average picture in our region. So if you ask yourself, what is the share of population for whom transition delivered convergence to incomes of high, country, uh, high income countries, you would end up with a number of something like 44%. So for a minority of people, transition has delivered. So we should not forget uh, that issue when we are surprised that majority of population votes against uh, anti-reform, uh, sorry, pro-reform politicians. Now, the next question is what happens next. So, if uh, you have, uh, uh, if you have uh, strong political institutions, strong democratic institutions, you can have a situation where anti-reform populists come to power and say, don't worry, we will fix this issue, we'll create a model where everybody benefits from growth, and then you uh, see what happens when populists come to power. I will not name countries, but in many countries where anti-reform politicians actually came to power, they managed to uh, destroy growth. The growth would slow down. They would also build a chronic capitalist system where they would enrich their friends. And uh, they will not actually deliver to the uh, majority. And then you would ask a question, okay, if these populists do not deliver, why won't pro-market reformers come back to power and, um, and continue the reforms. And the answer is, if those populists destroy political checks and balances, take control of media, of courts, of uh, uh, campaign financing, in some of those countries, unfortunately, uh, the pro-market or pro-democratic or pro-European opposition no longer can come back, simply because the political system is entrenched and uh, uh, political competition no longer works. If political system works well, then it turns out that, well, opposition can come back and continue reforms. But unfortunately, in most of our countries, political institutions are imperfect, young, and not very solid. So this is, this is the danger. Um, so this is why in the BRD we, now much more, we are now much more careful about the issue of inclusion. And so when I came to the bank in 2016, uh, we revised what we call transition concept, the definition of the desired destination of transition. So we used to think about promoting private ownership competition uh, markets, and for us it was a very important goal, but when, then we realized that it is not enough. We are still in favor of competitiveness of the economy. Uh, meaning good institutions of market economy, meaning uh, private sector uh, initiative, entrepreneurship, uh, competition, and so on. But now we also add other qualities of successful, sustainable market economy, and one of them is inclusion, which means, which doesn't mean that we need to go back to socialism and make sure that everybody earns the same. We are still against that because we think it's an uh, unfair in equ uh, unfair equality. So we don't like unfair e equality. Unfair equality for young people, I would explain, is when however hard you work, you get the same. So it, it sounds unfair to us in the sense that if you work harder, you should be paid better. Uh, but then we are also again against unfair inequality, which is if you are born into a rich family, you have better opportunity. If you are uh, if you have a uh, different race or gender or ethnicity, you have a better economic opportunity. Um, so these are, uh, or if you are born in a different place, you have a better opportunity. These are factors of 
uh, exogenous circumstances which you cannot control and we think that this inequality of opportunity is unfair. And so this is why we now focus on inclusion and we try to uh, promote economic opportunity for people who are disadvantaged. Whether they are born in a wrong place, well, wrong economically, whether they are born in a poor household and have less access to skills, uh, education and so on, whether they have a gender which is not, uh, which is not uh, um, uh, uh, providing them with equal uh, opportunity. So these are now very important parts of thinking about the mission. Why? Because we think that equal economic opportunity increases political legitimacy of the reforms. Now, I should say that we measure those things, and I should say that this country, Georgia, actually comes last in terms of equality of opportunity. I'm happy to talk about this methodology, but this is where I can actually say something about Georgia. This is where the issue of inclusion is the biggest. Now, let me uh, go further. So what else can undermine political legitimacy of reforms? Interestingly, in some countries, we see that uh, reforms deliver to everybody. So, for example, Poland is a country where, uh, where uh, transition has been extremely successful from an economic point of view. But then it turns out that if there is a perception that the system is not fair, that it doesn't work for everybody in the same way, uh, if you think that elites are detached from the people, then you end up with a situation when even people who've benefited from the reform economically may actually deem the system um, illegitimate. And when we uh, econometrically analyze the impact of this perception of uh, unfair system, we see that even people who do well in terms of income, access to jobs, and so on, even they, if they believe that the system is corrupt, or this is the system which is non-meritocratic in the sense that connections matter more than uh, effort and skill, uh, this is uh, the system where people also reject reforms and vote for anti-reform politicians. And uh, this is the issue of governance, which is now also part of our mandate. So we try to promote uh, business models which uh, create um, meritocratic institutions and uh, more transparency and accountability of companies, uh, subnational uh, governments and national governments. And uh, let me actually just list other qualities of uh, sustainable market economies that we introduced to measure what the right destination is, being uh, a resilience of uh, financial system, integration of markets, cross-border and within-border, but also environmental sustainability of the economy, uh, which is for us very important, also because it's inclus inclusion of future generations' interests, inclusion of people who uh, cannot be represented today in the political process. But overall, I think these are these two issues that I wanted to focus on, which undermine political sustainability of reform, which are inclusion and governance, uh, which I wanted to focus on. And basically the takeaway is if you design a reform package, if you want to make the reform package irreversible, you should uh, focus both on outcomes and the process. The outcomes should be thought of not just the average income per capita, but the distribution. You want to make sure that even if you have fast growth, the benefits of this growth are distributed widely. Otherwise, you risk to be kicked out of office. And as I said, in countries where democratic institutions are not mature, this um, political change may be permanent, in the sense that coming back in the next election will not be easy, because some of those anti-reform politicians do not respect uh, democratic values and can actually destroy the system of political competition and will not let you back. So when you design a reform, you need to think about vulnerable households, you need to make sure that the benefits of transitions, transition are distributed widely. But then outcomes are not enough. The process also matters. If you design reforms, you need to make sure that at every point the public understands that you're in the same boat. So the reformers are not detached from the population. So reformers are not doing this reform for themselves only. And uh, the public should understand that there is accountability of the government to the public. And uh, the government should always send this message that uh, we are not above the law. And even if public benefits materially from the reforms, 
if there is this suspe uh, suspicion of corruption, non-meritocracy, the, the government, the elites may again be kicked out. And this is what, uh, what we see in many, many countries, not just in our countries, not just in the BRD countries. I, I, I uh, uh, entitled this talk EU Neighborhood, but many of the things that I was talking about also apply to certain advanced economies. It's just that we've observed them before 2016 the year of uh, presidential election in the US and referendum on EU membership in the Great Britain. So these are, these are the issues I wanted, I wanted to mention and uh, let me actually stop here and uh, take your questions. Thank you. So maybe a couple of questions, not only one. Firstly, um, through your experience, uh, does economy exist without politics? I mean, not partisan politics, but I mean, also possibly policy and so on. So is it, can it be purely just something with we, what we know from textbooks or uh, I mean, some theories is one thing. Mm, the second thing is um, uh, how to distinguish between providing equal opportunities for possible success with equal opportunities which is let's say de facto and what actually people expect um, because I, I think it's a tricky issue because if there is high pace of economic development uh, we have so it's like a, like in sports yeah I mean high speed few winners. Lower speed, maybe more participants and possibly a little bit more winners, but the pace is not that high. So how, how maybe I don't know, in, in, in the view of EBRD or your personal professional view, how this can be balanced? That people understand equal opportunities is not something which is su supplied by somebody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vato. So on the first issue, are there areas of economic policy where you don't need to think about politics? So um, the issues I was talking about, uh, the uh, meritocracy of political process or economic process and distributional outcomes suggest that whenever you make an economic decision which has distributional outcomes, you need to think about political implications. That's for sure. So uh, we, uh, for example, in many countries we push for increasing uh, utility tariffs to market rates, uh, uh, electricity prices for households to market rates, removing subsidies for households, because it's uh, good for environment, it's also um, good for efficiency, but of course we also promote supporting the poorest households, right? So people should see how efficiency works for everybody. Um, that is not always popular, and um, it's also in some countries you have a pushback because, uh, let, me, let me take a, an abstract country in which a teacher or a doctor believes that he's a middle class representative because after he pays electricity tariffs, he has a lot of money left. And then suddenly we raise utility tariffs and then you, uh, the teacher and doctor knows that he would still get money from the government to support his uh, income, but then suddenly he moves from a middle class representative to a poor category because he needs to apply for social benefits, for the social support. And this is now an identity issue. But this is just uh, restoring the economic 
uh, rationale. And then the question is whether politicians can provide communication which shows that, look, this is what electricity costs. This is how it should be. And uh, we should raise your salary. But before you ra we raise your salary, sorry, you will have to apply for social benefit. So there are, th there are economic and non-economic issues. But there the politics is always there. Now, there are some areas in economics which are completely technocratic. One of these areas now is, for example, fighting inflation. If you want to lower inflation, in principle you can. And many countries which have otherwise corrupt, non-democratic, uh, and in many cases incompetent regimes, know that if they want to fight inflation, they need to hire independent central bankers, tell them please lower inflation, and that's doable. Now, not everybody wants to do that uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but uh, in principle, it is reasonably uncontroversial decision. Of course, fighting inflation may also involve political implications, and that's exactly some why some countries don't want to do it. But it is reasonably non-controversial. So, because lower inflation benefits everybody, monetary stability, uh, macroeconomic stability benefits everybody. So, your next question was about economic opportunity versus equality of outcomes or the um, uh, dependency culture, if you like. So what we think uh, economic opportunity will be in the future is be driven by access to human capital, access to skills. So for us, equal opportunity is whoever your parents are, you have access to good education. And uh, that eventually drives, drives your access to good jobs. And then, of course, mobility, connectivity to markets. So if you are in a small town, you can uh, work for a company globally without leaving your town. That may or may not work. Or you can move to a big town, big city, where you can find a job. Um, the other issue is, of course, access to healthcare, which is a big issue in many of our countries, which actually shortens economic life, economic activity. So this is also an issue. And this is where you don't get the dependency culture, but where you have access to public goods, which are... Uh, uh, providing you with an uh, economic opportunity. Now, does that mean that I'm against private schools or private healthcare providers? No. But I would like to see that even if you come from a poor family, you still have access to private education or healthcare uh, because somebody uh, pays for tuition fee or, or doctor's fees in, on some kind of schemes. So accessibility of high quality education and healthcare is um, equal opportunity issue. And then, of course, as I mentioned, connectivity, infrastructure, access to modern technology is also part of equal opportunity. So this, is, this, this I think, is, again, something where we have a consensus on what can promote equal opportunity without creating a socialist redistribution system. Yeah. Yeah, we have a question. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I have one question about uh, unfair equality and unfair inequality, as you mentioned. Uh, so don't you think uh, these two contradict each other? Like, um, and uh, I also wanted to ask you if uh, we try to equalize everyone at the birth, like somebody was born in a rich family and somebody was born in poor family, obviously they have different opportunities but uh, why they shouldn't have it. And uh, people are working exactly because to create their children better future. And if we will abolish this system, then uh, we abolish the incentives to work and be, to be creative. And we will make everyone poor. And it was tried many times in many socialist countries. It never worked. And uh, so uh, the question is like, uh, and also about healthcare and uh, education. Uh, neither of them is are public goods because in order to be a public good, it should be both uh, non-exclusive, exclusive no. and uh, uh, non-rivalers. Mm -hmm. Neither of them are these. And why do you think then that it should be provided by the government? And um, 
Uh, don't you think that uh, the concept of, as I mentioned uh, uh, already, uh, fairness in inequality contradicts fairness in inequality? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. These are excellent questions. Um, so, um, first, let me uh, quickly add to my, because it's related to my response to uh, Vato's question, which is uh, sometimes you want to sacrifice speed for fairness uh, uh, and for political legitimacy, because what we've seen is sometimes reforms were fast, but then they were reversed. And it turns out that if you go slowly but steadily and you're, you achieve political support and political legitimacy at every step, you can actually go farther and faster in the long run. So uh, avoiding reversals is probably a better strategy if you want to achieve speed over the long run, even if at every given moment you seem to progress slowly. Uh, it, uh, your question, I think, is an excellent one, and I uh, uh, partially agree with you. Uh, that in a sense that if uh, we think about perfect equality uh, for kids, you may destroy parents' incentives to work. I fully agree. I'm a parent myself. And uh, while I recognize the government's effort to promote equal opportunity for poorer kids, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not in the poor category, uh, so I see that it comes at the expense of my kids. And uh, as a parent, I'm very worried about this. So uh, I taught at Sciences Po, and uh, at Sciences Po we have, for example, this equal opportunity program where 15% uh, of students have to come from disadvantaged school districts. Sounds like a great idea in the sense that, well, uh, there are talented kids who go to uh, bad schools, relatively bad schools. Uh, probably the best student from a bad school is an excellent student. The problem is that if you are 86 percentile kid from a good school, these uh, students from bad schools crowd you out. And so for you, it's not a great reform. So I fully, I, I fully agree with you that this is the most important issue related to, to providing equality at birth. I think, however, we are not there to the extent that um, there is too much equality at birth right now. Uh, I think uh, I would be against this anti-utopian world where all kids are provided perfect equality at birth through the methods uh, which we read about in anti-utopian books, where you take kids away from the parents and put them in a special box and then grow them as, I don't know, chickens. Uh, I think we are not there, and there is a lot of transmission of human capital between parents and kids, which of course provides a lot of, a lot of opportunity uh, for richer kids. Now, I can, I can give you an example uh, of uh, what the uh, French government is doing now, which I probably support, is uh, uh, in bad schools, the government pays for more teachers, which is called doubling the number of teachers, the doublement. And they think that, unfortunately, these kids don't get enough uh, teachers' attention, so we'll pay for more teachers in bad schools, in, in bad districts, in a sense, in relatively bad districts. So that is probably equalizing opportunity. That comes at the expense of rich people, because these teachers have to be paid by somebody. And of course, it comes from taxpayers' account. And so, of course, it is a policy which is going in that direction. But still, I think we are at the, sa at the situation where we don't have a risk of perfect equality at birth whatever happens. So kids who come from richer and better educated families still have much better opportunities. And so reducing this gap in opportunities is increasing productivity. Why? Because some talented kids are born in poor neighborhoods. So that promotes aggregate efficiency. But of course, it also promotes the feeling of fairness and therefore political legitimacy. Now, your next question is about whether education is a public good. So. Uh, you're right that if you open the uh, textbook, excludability and non-rivalry is exactly what defines the public good. In uh, policy debates, of course, uh, we occasionally abuse the terminology. And so what I mean by this is education is a positive externality product. So if you teach a good student in this university, the whole society benefits more than the student alone. Uh, if uh, you have more 
educated people around, crime goes down, productivity goes up, everything is better. And so if we just ask uh, for private returns to education, these are probably smaller than public returns to education. So it makes economic sense to pay more for education than a student can pay. And that is not to say that the students shouldn't pay. Again, I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, students who come from rich families should pay, and p students who come from uh, cash constraints families may actually take a student loan. So that, I, I fully agree with you, that may make sense. Now, the question is, uh, uh, should government in some capacity support student loans or scholarships? If you think that there is a positive externality, then the answer is yes. And I think there is, there is positive externality. On healthcare, I think situation is actually even harder. I think um, in uh, Western civilization, we have uh, the concept that if a person is suffering, we'll try to um, relieve the sufferings of the person, even if the person is poor. Which means government or society eventually will have to pay for some treatment. And then, of course, it's a bit of a hypocritical answer to your question because in some cases, the government say, we, like to, we would like to save your life, but that would cost too much. We don't have this money, so you should just die, right? And some governments are honest about this. So in the UK, you have this concept of quality adjusted, quality adjusted life years. So if the cost of, of prolonging your life by one year is above something like uh, 30,000 pounds, I think, it's, it should be quality adjusted. So it's not just a year, but a year of good life. So uh, the public system says, sorry, we cannot pay for this. We just don't have enough money. We should help somebody else who, whom we can, at this cost, help better. But still, there is some consensus in the society that even poor people should be provided some basic care, even if they don't have money. And this is our social rather than economic consensus. So this is where we are. And so I can tell you, please pay for your health care. And you will tell me, sorry. I know that uh, I have to buy insurance, but I forgot to buy it, so I don't have money. Uh, what should I do? The government will still uh, bail you out because of the social views on what, what uh, our response to poverty should be. So this is, this is where we are. This is kind of a non-economic answer. Unfair versus unfair inequality, once again, this is unfair, there is unfair equality where everybody gets the same whatever the effort is. This is fair inequality, where if you work more, you get more. Inequality emerges, but uh, you get more than I do because you work harder. That's fine. And then there is unfair inequality, where we work the same amount of time with the same effort and skill, but you get more because you are born in the right family, I'm not. So this is unfair inequality for me. And unfortunately, this country, uh, in this country, uh, among all of the countries, the highest share of inequality of income is explained by factors which are outside of your control, such as place of birth, family of birth, uh, gender. So, so this is the country where issues of economic opportunity and inclusion are the top issues in our region. So this is why I wanted to talk about this. Other questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, so maybe building on the topic of uh, fair, inequ fair equality, fair inequality, uh, and taking this question to the next level in terms of, like we're looking at the problems from the past, it feels like we're looking on the problems of the past century. But then if we look forward and we think about the technological unemployment, so what's your take on what's coming up in terms of you know, disruption of industries, people getting laid off because of this unemploy unemployment and, you know, potentially many jobs being created in the develop developed world um, at the expense of the less advantaged, this part of the region, for example. So what's your take on what questions should we be asking ourselves, politicians, in terms of preparing for this future? Thank you. This is an excellent question, and I think this is the number one global challenge now. 
And uh, this challenge came first to the advanced economies where technological progress, first and foremost technological progress, and only then trade, globalization, has created a uh, decrease in middle skilled employment. So if you look at American job market, actually all advanced economies job market, you see job polarization. Uh, jobs are created at a high end of skill distribution. Uh, if you have a degree from a good university uh, in the US, you will have a higher probability to get a job and your salary will be growing fast, right? Because there is a shortage of skilled people, even in the United States, and their wages are growing fast. Then jobs are also created in the bottom of skill distribution, uh, routine manual jobs. Uh, where jobs are requiring relatively little skill, so wages are low, so it doesn't pay off to automate those jobs or to outsource those jobs. But then in the middle of the skill distribution, jobs are either automated or outsourced. Could be routine white-collar job or could be a blue-collar job. These jobs are actually shrinking. And you see this social crisis in the United States. So today we see that middle-aged white men lose their jobs when they're 45 or 50 and some of these people well these people should get new skills and move to the high skilled end of the distribution but getting new skills is hard i don't know you are young people so you know it's easy to learn new things i whenever i try to learn new language in my age i, I find it's extremely difficult right and um, so some of these people don't learn new skills. Many of these people don't learn new skills. And they may go to get a low-skill job. But when they go to the low-skill job segment, they increase this downward pressure on wages. Their wages are lower, so they're again unhappy, as they should be. Or they just exit the job market. And, and this is what I'm talking now is evidence-based. These people play video games. These people consume opioids, these people drink a lot, and they commit suicides. And today we are talking about increasing middle-aged male mortality in this segment. Life expectancy of white middle-aged men is going down in today's United States. When we think about that, we would say it's impossible in a developed country in peacetime. We've seen that in Russia and Ukraine in the 1990s. But it is a social crisis, and indeed it's a number one challenge in today's United States. In continental Europe, things are not as bad. Why? Because if you lose your job, your kids will still have get access to good education and good health care. And so you have these two social models. If you asked me 15 years ago, I would say American model is actually better because it's more uh, providing more incentives for innovation, uh, for, uh, for creating uh, firms and so on. Uh, today it looks like American system may be not sufficiently generous in terms of supporting kids of parents who were not fortunate enough to have the right skills. So, uh, and in that sense you can imagine what my answer is to your question. My answer is to make sure that people who lose their jobs still don't have to die. And their kids still have uh, access to better opportunity. Now, they will not have access to opportunity which is as good as kids of university professors or, or uh, uh, software engineers. Uh, I don't think there is a risk of that. But they have to have access at least to healthcare. And in the US, as you know, if you don't have a job, your access to healthcare is completely different even now after Obamacare. Right, so this, is, so this is a huge issue. And then there is a debate about universal basic income. Should governments provide uh, an income which keeps you above minimum subsistence level? And there is a debate what this income should be. In Switzerland, they brought uh, the number of 2,800 francs, so roughly $2,800 per month, to referendum. And it was rejected. Uh, in the uh, US, the number they are talking about $1,000 a month. In Finland, it's 500 something euros per month. In France, also something like 700 euros per month. In Italy, 500 euros per month. So this is an amount which still pushes you into uh, interest in working, right? It's not, it's not a great life in Europe if you have 500 euros per month. But still, it keeps you above certain level, especially if your kids have access to healthcare uh, and uh, education. So this is a very difficult debate. 
Uh, I, I can talk more about universal basic income. I think there are many things which people don't fully understand about uni universal basic income. And people also don't, uh, don't appreciate that Finnish experiment which just ended or finished uh, uh, actually provided reasonably positive results. But uh, we've not yet uh, run a really big scale uh, convincing experiment, except in one country. Interesting experiment was run in Iran. Iran substituted fuel and food subsidies with a cash pay uh, in 2011. And it turned out that uh, labor supply didn't go down, people still worked, and so on and so forth. And they did it in two installments. So first half of the population uh, went through that reform, and then the other half. And turns out that we can see that this move to unconditional cash payments did not destroy incentives to work. If anything, some people started to work more, but anyway. So overall, this universal basic income idea is also something which is seriously discussed. As you rightly said, this automation technological change does hit middle-income countries like, say, Georgia, or like, say, Slovakia. So countries in Central Europe, like Slovakia, have benefited immensely from integrated into German value chains. Now the question is, what will happen when Germany doesn't need labor-intensive value chains? because of robots. Of course, Slovakian worker is cheaper than German worker. But German robot may become cheaper than Slovakian worker. And then the question is what Slovakian workers will do. So this issue is right there. Which brings me to a piece of advice. If you're a middle-income country, you should be prepared that you will have a different trajectory of convergence. You will not build your own globally competitive manufacturing. You need to think immediately about building innovative sector, building knowledge intensive sector. This is what services, this is what may create more jobs. Services become more and more tradable and uh, tradable knowledge intensive services is something that can provide jobs even if and when robots come. The problem is of course to identify services which are not automatable. And here is a piece of advice for you. The data show that the least automatable occupations are Software engineering, economics, finance, law, and something else. But basically, uh, all these wonderful things that we teach and that we practice. And education, per se. Education, per se, is less automatable. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yeah, there's a question here. Uh, so you divided the, uh, like, uh, pro-reformer politicians and anti-reformer politicians and like uh, I have such questions whether there are like uh, some social division like some social circles uh, in like such countries where in which you discussed support anti-reformers or and like some social uh, class supports like pro-reformers is there such division like that shows in most of the countries to be the same or it's like different on each of the countries. And the second question is like, uh, you, uh, uh, when you talked about when like government inclusiveness, like, or any government action, yeah? Uh, like uh, make it, uh, making like education benefits and uh, like giving some health, uh, health access to many people you like discussed it in a way that like social so it like is bad for economy but like it's good for like social value yeah? and to make like reforms be like non-recursive uh, is there some government uh, a government movement that is like uh, government interventions that by itself is good for economy it's not good for like social things or like Maybe it is as well, but like primary for economy, government intervention. Right. Um, uh, we did have uh, disagreements with CAHA on those issues, uh, especially say 20 years ago, but less so say uh, four years ago. Um, uh, basically, he would, uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, he would just call me socialist. Uh, my job is actually to be a pro-market economist, and uh, I think I, I am a pro-market economist, but I think markets should be politically popular. Which brings me to your question. 
So in general, the division, the social division is that you have people who benefit from reforms. These are these high skilled, generally people, who, high skilled people who benefit from technological progress, investment, globalization. Generally, these are people who have better education and who work in tradable sectors. And uh, uh, then you have reasonably low skilled people uh, who work in sectors um, that are, uh, that depend on uh, uh, the local demand, which in less developed countries is re reasonably low. And so their compensation is relatively low. And so this is the, the objective division. But then there is also a subjective division. So all research we do shows that perceptions matter and perceptions may be different from reality. So if you ask yourself what is unequal inequality in your country, we show that in many places people overestimate inequality. Why? Because there are populist politicians who come to them and say our country uh, has a disastrous situation with inclusion, inequality and so on. Let me fix that. And mainstream politicians and technocrats somehow think that the data will speak themselves. And this is wrong. If you want to defend uh, reforms, you also need to talk to the people and to explain, well, look, you know that you will actually benefit from the reform. And so this is, uh, this communication part, this political work is essential and unfortunately in many of our countries, and this is especially true for the European Union uh, bureaucrats, they don't spend enough effort and time in explaining the benefits of the reforms, potential benefits to people who will benefit but who don't know about this. So it's not just the objective social division of people who benefit and who lose out, but also the communication. And the pol this is what politics is, right? Politics is explaining why this particular action will benefit you and, uh, and not you. And then uh, the other issue is you, you can design reforms that people who would stand to lose from the reforms initially would be compensated. So this is yet another issue. And then your, uh, your second question, which government interventions can promote, uh, can promote markets, can promote growth? Well, uh, I still believe in antitrust policy. I think monopoly is bad. And I think uh, fighting monopoly is actually good policy. I also believe in uh, enforcement on, of contracts. I think this is very important. And I think, in, uh, I think infrastructure investment and connectivity is good. Uh, when you think about a person born in a small town, having an opportunity of moving to a big city or traveling every day to a bigger city is an important pro-market action where you actually connect people to markets. You make markets more efficient, better function, and so on. And so all things which make markets work better remove frictions. This is a pro-market government policy. And uh, you would say that frictions only emerge because government policy itself. That is true, that happens in, in some cases, but some frictions emerge on their own because of physical distance, uh, because of asymmetric information, uh, because of, uh, uh, because of uh, uh, emergence of market power and monopoly. So this is, this is uh, so one of the things is regulation of financial markets. So you want capital markets to work better. You want, um, uh, you want disclosure of information. You want to enforce this disclosure of information by um, those who issue stocks. Uh, so this is, this is a typical policy. Then, for example, you want uh, local markets, uh, local financial markets to develop. So you want, uh, uh, issue bonds not in dollars but in local currency. You want somebody to create this market. You want to issue bonds in local markets to establish price benchmarks. So uh, more often than not that means the government should come out to the market and issue local currency denominated bonds to create a yield curve. Uh, you want to create insurance market. You need data. Insurance markets are very complicated markets. Without data it's very hard to build markets. So somebody has to come and start issuing new products before their data. And so this is what development banks like us do. This is what governments should do. Some, sometimes markets are not existing because they are not created yet. So yeah. thanks. Yeah, there is one more question. Yeah, yeah. OK. Hello. 
Uh, I'm asking you as a uh, as potential from the Orthodox country citizen, like, should countries with quite sentimental history uh, support the idea of economical growth or at the expense of the managing national culture or sacrificing the religion? For example, like green light to a prostitution would do a great hit to a black market, which would eventually uh, support the economical growth. Also, uh, celebrating religious days uh, costs a lot of money to government. So, is there uh, any way to grow the economy and sacrifice religion? But would it be right for countries like Austria, Georgia, and Russia, and something like that? I could supply like more examples, but I think you got what my point is. Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, uh, this is eventually a political choice yeah. for every country to choose uh, to choose uh, what you wa what you want to see in your country, what kind of social and economic system to see in your country. And this is uh, we support democracy, so we believe that if voters fully understand the implications, cultural, political, economic implications of their votes, they should vote and decide what they want to see in their country. Of course, so this is a choice for every country. Uh, what uh, we as a uh, European bank promote is something that is completely compatible, I think, with uh, European, with Christian values. If you think about a uh, Christian approach to ethnicity, then of course uh, Jesus Christ would always say that uh, we should not differentiate between Jews and Samaritans, right? And uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, something which is completely in line with uh, what, what we believe in. When I was talking about equality of opportunity, this is something that I don't think contradicts, uh, contradicts uh, uh, Christian values. And then, of course, uh, we believe that women should have the same rights as, uh, as uh, men. Some countries decide differently, and who are we to tell those countries? But we believe that women have... Have, should have the same rights. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there is a question here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Guriev, imagine you are a Georgian citizen, a uh, well informed Georgian citizen with all the information about uh, uh, the standing of Georgian economy. Uh, would you rather prefer uh, or vote or uh, support uh, political economy of radical reforms in Georgia today or reject it? Well, Either I think, yeah, so I think, I think, uh, uh, depends what you mean by radical reforms. If these are pro-market reforms which uh, at the same time make sure that nobody is left behind, uh, sure, of course, why not? And uh, I think, uh, uh, so one thing I can tell you is because of the reforms uh, carried out in the last 15 years, uh, Georgia is still a champion in reforms, in openness, in competitiveness in the region. So Georgia is not doing as well in terms of levels of income per capita, but in terms of speed of reforms, openness, Georgia is still, still a champion. Well, it's not a very high standard. So if you look at other countries in our region, uh, we have all kinds of um, problems, but uh, yeah. But uh, what I, I will try to mm -hmm. explain mm -hmm. what yeah. I meant actually. Yeah. Uh, to champion in the fields, we, are, we, we have less good standing. Yeah. Do we need uh, to take some radical steps or to follow the standard rules of uh, development and uh, succeed as you once mm -hmm. mentioned in your speech um, in, in long term and uh, be more successful in long term well I think I think we all uh, we are all supposed to live more than four years from now or five years from now and definitely more than uh, uh, next elections uh, horizon so we all are expecting to live longer term than next political cycle so we should think about longer term that's for sure which by the way brings me back to the human capital issue so human capital investments usually pay off in the very long term, which means you need to start as soon as possible, right? And in this sense, if you think about, um, in, if you think about uh, 
uh, longer term success, it is driven by human capital. But then the question is, if you invest in human capital, you also need to create institutions which create jobs for skilled people here. Because otherwise you invest in human capital and then these people leave. And again, it's good for these people and this brings us back to the issue that people do benefit from education and the global economy, that's fine. But if you pay for this with government money, you should also create firms, jobs here. And for that you need radical reforms. So the good news about Georgian economy is it has DCFTA. It can export to a huge market, Europe. The question is, can you create jobs here for firms that export to Europe? And that's the challenge. And these are the two sides of the same coin. Foreign investors come where they have skills. But skills are created and kept in places where there are jobs for these skills. And this is why you need a vision and you need persistence in promoting reforms that create opportunities for investors, for firms that have demand for skills, but you also invest in supply of skills. So, yeah. Yeah, there is one question. Well, thank you for a very interesting <laughs> lecture. Uh, my question would be, a bit more direct to the subject. Uh, I would like to ask about the free economic zones. Mm -hmm. We had a, a, I would say, practice of implementing it in later 2000s, but I guess it failed. But how do you see what are the advantages and disadvantages of those uh, free economic zones for our country and our neighborhood as well? Because for some countries, it proved to be a success story. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a very simple question. So if you have a big country and you know that you cannot carry out radical reform in the whole country, that may be a good, uh, a good uh, path forward. And this is exactly what China did. Uh, if you have a small country like Georgia and you believe that you can carry out reforms in the whole country, you should try to do that. Sure. And uh, foreign, uh, for free economic zones uh, are not necessarily creating... Uh, success, sometimes you can create c corruption and uh, yeah, all kinds of issues, right? So uh, it's not always the success that uh, uh, we can see in the free economic zones. Um, you read about successful free economic zones, but it's not necessarily uh, what uh, will follow. So if you can reform the whole country, especially if you talk about small country, you can create a free economic zone size of the country, which is what DCFTA is, right? So it's not... It's not uh, it's not exactly a free economic zone, but it is the partial response to your question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mm -hmm. Guri, mm -hmm. um, если можно, подскажите, как вы считаете, какие самые главные экономические проблемы в Грузии, и если можно, как вы видите пути решения этих проблем? Спасибо. Если был вопрос по-русски, я тогда отвечу по-русски. Я думаю, что на сегодняшний день ключевые проблемы – это то, что я сказал, образование, и, а также юридическая система. Вот, и все пути решения этих проблем известны, и будем надеяться, что эти решения будут реализованы. Да, да, да, счет пробы. Thank you. Thank you very much for good questions. Thank you. Thank you.